Dear friends of the Care Conference, dear Banshi, dear Chairman and Chairwoman, I really thank you and I am honored to be part of your Congress, but unfortunately due to another meeting that it is in the same moment that this presentation in India, I have to pre-record it and to send it to you, hoping that it will be better than me totally absent in your Congress. The, the title of my presentation is Teaming up to tackle cardiorenal risk in diabetes. Uh, on uh, January 2017, the Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology was taking in consideration the lastest figure of IDF Diabetes Atlas, with more than 425 million people with diabetes in the world and projected to rise to more than 629 million by 2045. 4 million people have died of diabetes on 2000. 17. And the growing burden of diabetes complication, where cardiovascular disease in people with diabetes is raised by two to three times, and the risk for development of end stage renal disease is raised by 10 times. Diabetic complications are very serious and very frequent in people with diabetes, but especially a patient with nephropathy. And cardiovascular disease, it's more common than the others, and the risk for death is more in increased than with the other uh, complications. So, if we have to recognize early and to intervene to prevent these complications, we will prevent also the death and before dialysis in people with diabetes. Which is more important, renal or cardiovascular complications on diabetes? For years now, we are used to see that the cardiovascular complication is very important for people with diabetes. But death is far more common than end-stage renal disease in patients with chronic diseases. And cardiovascular disease accounts for about 7100% of costs for chronic complication on diabetes, where also we may see that 8% is the cost of renal complication in diabetes. But uh, Circulation and Kidney International has shown that the kidney is very close related with this cardiovascular risk factor in people with diabetes. Till now, we are used to, to treat diabetes, controlling intensive blood glucose, control of blood pressure, and using AC inhibitors or AI blockers. But the most important part has been always treating hyperglycemia. UK prospective study showed that in patients with type 2 diabetes, after 10 years, a 0.9% reduction in glycated hemoglobin had a wonderful effect on microvascular side, but not on the macrovascular side. So, Improving glycated hemoglobin, does it decrease the risk for cardiovascular disease? In the analysis, 10 years after the UK PDS, also both groups had almost the same glycated hemoglobin. You, we can see that there was an effect in macrovascular disease with a decrease of 16% of heart failure, 14% of myocardiovascular infarction and 12% reduction on stroke. So, controlling glycated hemoglobin could reduce the complication, not only the micro, but also the macrovascular disease. And other studies have shown that controlling glycated hemoglobin could also
decrease the risk for cardiovascular disease and also the risk for mortality. But a lot of our patients, even that we have common goals for vacated hemoglobin, are not reaching this goal. For example, in Europe, in the CODE 2 study, about 69% of our patients had a glycated hemoglobin of more than 6.5%. So, the diabetic world war is not over. Do you think that now it's time for a change? Let's see a little bit the pathophysiology of type 2 diabetes. Till now, we have seen that we have a classic triumvirate, so impaired insulin secretion, decreased glucose uptake, and increased hepatic glucose production. All these going and creating a hyperglycemia. But now we are passing from the classic triumvirate to the ominous octet, with decreased incretin effect, increased lipolysis, increased glucose reabsorption, decreased insulin secretion, increased glucagon secretion. And all these creating the premises for hyperglycemia. And it is hard to treat type 2 diabetes adequately because type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. For infections, we know that we have a bacteria, we have the antibiotic, we have the symptom, the fever, and we have the treatment. But do we do the same with insulin resistance in type 2 diabetes? What causes resistance with antibiotics? The continuous use of the same antibiotics will create the resistance to the uh, microbes. And are we doing the same with insulin resistance, putting in treatment some medicaments that are increasing the risk or even worse, using insulin to treat hyperinsulinemia? And this is the base of resistance, the reinforcing circles of resistance through a persistence exposure. And we have to remember that uh, there was a close relation between increased body weight, insulin resistance, and the risk of cancer in people with type 2 diabetes. Till now, we, this is the algorithm for the treatment of diabetes. Metformin, metformin plus anti and oral antidiabetics, insulin, more insulin, more insulin over the time. And in this way, we are creating an increase in insulin resistance, trying to decrease the glycated hemoglobin, but with the cost of weight gain, increased myocardial infarction, and increase the risk of cancer in people with diabetes. So probably now it's time to get started. So we, we have to choose treatments that are decreasing the insulin resistance and controlling blood glucose, but also in the meantime we need to manage diabetic complications because management of plasma glucose is not enough. So we need to increase the insulin availability to improve insulin sensitivity, but also we may increase the urinary glucose excretion and delay the delivery and absorption of carbohydrate from gastrointestinal tract. This is a new chapter for diabetic, cardiac and kidney disease. The use of two kinds of treatment. There are three uh, medicaments in the group of ESGL2-1 inhibitors. Sanaglyphosine, dapaglyphosine and epaglyphosine. All these are approved for the treatment of type 2 diabetes. And they block the SGL2 antagonist, so the glucose is not coming back, but it's going through the urine. And so the body is losing glucose, losing calorie, but also improving uh, glucose in the blood. 
There are several studies that have shown the fantastic positive effect in cardiovascular outcomes with these medicaments. In a study where with 700 patients in 42 countries, and a lot of these patients have a decrease in glomerular filtration rate, the EMPAREG results have shown that these treatments improve con blood glucose control, decrease weight in these patients, decrease the systolic blood pressure and uric acid. But in the meantime, they decrease the cardiovascular risk of 14%, the mortality of 32% and hospitalization for heart failure of about 35%. So they are improving the cardiovascular outcome. And what is even better is that in the post hoc analysis of primary endpoints, they show an impressive renal protection compared with placebo. And this is wonderful news because using empagliposine not only reduces cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure, but also may reduce renal events. So, giving a double con contribution in improving life and long in making longer the life of people with diabetes. And the same, uh, it was true for not worsening of nephropathy in people with diabetes. So SGL2 inhibitors represent a towering milestone in the management of patients with type 2 diabetes. And the same, it is true with canagliflozin. Apart the improvement in body weight, glycated hemoglobin, systolic and diastolic blood pressure, they improve the risk of cardiovascular disorders by about 14% and heart failure hospitalization by 33%. And in the meantime, they decrease the risk of progression of albuminuria in people with diabetes. So these medicaments provide real protection against kidney decline. Another chapter for diabetic cardio, cardiac and kidney disease is the use of GLP agonist and DPP4 inhibitors. Some of the effects of GLP1 and DPP4 inhibitors are well known by you, decreasing the glucagon release, improving insulin secretion, and two of these uh, medicaments have shown renal protective effects as it is linagdiptin and liraglutide. In the leader study, the employing the GLP-1 agonist liraglutide has shown that it reduced the risk for cardiovascular disease and death from cardiovascular causes. Not only that, but it shows that it can improve the progression of kidney disease or the onset of new kidney disease. So this is wonderful news. And on the other hand, linagdiptin in Marlina study is effective on hypoglycemia and albuminuria in patients with type 2 diabetes and renal dysfunction. Linagdiptin decreased significantly glycated hemoglobin but had no significant impact on al albuminuria. But in phase 3 study in diabetic nephropathy with renal and poet, Carmelina study, it shows that it has a positive effect in decreasing the elevation of albuminuria and re uh, the reduction in kidney function. And what is more important, as you can see, linagdiptin is the only one of the preparates of 
GPP-4 inhibitors that can be used in all stages of renal disease. So now we are in the time when cardiology and nephrology meets endocrinology, especially type 2 diabetes, and especially with the use of two new kinds of medicaments, the ESG SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP1 agonists. They will impact clinical decision making and greater familiarity with and use of SGLT1 by cardiologists and nephrologists as well. So we need to think with new way instead of old way. If we have a patient with established cardiovascular disease and renal disease, we need to consider the use of these new medicaments because they do not cause hypoglycemia, they reduce cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death and seem to have a positive effect on kidney disease. And since 2018, ADA has uh, included in, his, in its guidelines the use of medicaments that have shown a positive effect in cardiovascular protection. This is my presentation for today. I'm very sorry that I cannot be with you, but I hope that in the near future we will be together again. I wish you a very successful Congress and very, thank you very much for inviting me at the Congress.